The humble mail truck is one of the most recognizable vehicles on the road. They're icons and they've been used continuously since 1985. But why? They're obviously outdated, they don't have AC, and they get horrible gas mileage, and they still use a 43-year-old engine notorious for starting on fire. Today, we're breaking down how this became the country's official courier truck, what makes it the worst truck for the job, and why don't we have a new one yet? Huge thank you to Omaze for sponsoring this episode of Wheelhouse. We're super stoked to team up with them once again to give away this 2018 Dodge Demon, a car I would like very much, plus taxes and shipping included, plus $20,000. Someone ready to take home a bad demon? Yeah. No, Doug, we're giving away this demon for a good cause. What's the big deal? 840 horsepower, 2.10 to 60? But can it do this? Doug, I gotta ask, why are you so competitive with this car? Just look at it, man. It's awesome. Comes with a crate full of cool demon stuff. The NHRA outlawed it for being too fast, and I'm over here drinking an envelope full of juice. What? Who would want this demon? I mean, it used to be you type demon in a search engine and you see a picture of me. Now it's all burnouts in the largest factory hood scoop ever. Pretty much ruined my SEO. Ah, oh, man, Doug, it. Don't worry about that, it'll be okay. Don't try to console me knowing I'm a demon, all right? Demons aren't supposed to be emotional, all right? <sighs> Go to amaze.com slash donutmedia for your chance to win. And uh, better yet, every donation helps the UCLA Ronald Reagan Medical Center, just in case you want to feel good about getting this badass car. Yeah. Can I borrow this to go get groceries? At least I got you tomato juice. <laughs> there are so many reasons why the current mail truck has worn out its welcome. But before we get into the laundry list of problems it has, let's get into a brief history of mail trucks and how the current model came to be. At the turn of the 20th century, automobiles were popping up all over the place, and the post office started using those as well, which was a smart move. But there was no uniformity to it, okay? According to the Smithsonian's Postal Museum, by 1921, the US Postal Fleet was running 43 different types of trucks made by 23 different manufacturers. The variety was a lot for mechanics to keep up with, and the cost and time it kept to maintain a fleet was a total drain. But then in 1953, the USPS wisened up and commissioned their first official mail delivery vehicle, the right-hand drive Jeep DJ, which stood for Dispatcher Jeep, Fresh off the heels of the Second World War, the Willis Jeep caught the eye of post officials. It was rugged, reliable, and inherently patriotic. It was so reliable, in fact, that a ton of other 4x4s were modeled after it, like a Land Rover and the Toyota Land Cruiser. Over the next few years, the Jeep DJ kept evolving and production changed hand from Willis Overland to Kaiser, eventually to AM General. The DJ's postal run took it all the way to the 80s, but as demands for the mail service grew, so did their need for a versatile upgrade in the truck department. I mean, I'm sure you've seen the back of a Jeep. You can't really fit a lot back there. Although you can still spot mail Jeeps running in rural parts of the country, dispatcher Jeeps were officially decommissioned in 1984 to make way for a new truck in town. But the post office wanted a truck that was totally unique and perfectly tailored to their needs. The only problem was, that didn't quite exist yet. In the 80s, the powers that be at the post office decided to do something a little crazy, and instead of shopping for existing models off the assembly line, they challenged automakers to make a new truck from scratch just for them. It was a bit of a power move and I respect that. The USPS drew up a detailed list of criteria that was reflective of their every mail delivering need, but their biggest goal was to procure a mail truck that could last at least 20 years in daily dispatch. After sorting through the losers, the contestants were narrowed down to just three finalists. There were Paveco, American Motors, and a collaboration between GM and Grumman, a company that had previously built spacecraft and fighter jets. The finalists' prototype were brought to Texas to compete in a series of challenges and tests. And let me tell you, this wasn't your average autocross, okay? These tests covered 24,000 miles and tested each vehicle's endurance and durability, maneuverability, and reliability. 
They included trials like passing each wheel over a pothole 35,000 times, driving almost 6,000 miles continuously at 55 miles per hour, driving over 960 miles over cobblestones and hauling a one-ton load for half of the whole road test. This grueling competition was not only necessary to see which was actually the best, there's also a lot riding on it, namely a billion dollar contract worth over two and a half billion in today's money. Finally, after the vehicles were tested, a winner emerged, the Grumman LLV, which stands for Long Life Vehicle. Grumman built the bodies, which were made of corrosion-resistant aluminum, since, you know, neither rain nor shine nor heat or all that. It flaunts a cargo capacity of 1,000 pounds and 123 cubic feet. GM provided the chassis, which was actually based off the 1982 Chevy S10 Blazer chassis, with the slight modification of putting the front wheels closer together for a tighter turn radius, which is actually pretty cool. And under the hood was a 98 horsepower, two and a half liter cast iron GM four banger. By the time the LLV hit the streets in 1986, this engine was already nine years old. And let me tell you, didn't have a great reputation. The Iron Duke was GM's overhead cam in line four of the late 70s, named for its cast iron block. In the 80s and 90s, GM put this engine in everything. It was in the Camaro, the Pontiac Grand Am, and the car you probably think of when you hear the name Iron Duke, the Fiero GT. Look, it didn't make a lot of power, but the cast iron construction gave it a high ceiling in case you wanted to give it a little more power, baby. Coming out of the oil crisis of the 80s, the Duke was lauded for its durability, emission standards, and fuel efficiency, which is why they put it in the LLV. But at 3,000 pounds with an extra 1,000 pounds in donut fan mail, the LLV only averaged nine miles per gallon. It was nine years outdated at the beginning of the LLV run. Add 30 to that, and you've got an engine old enough to have listened to the postal service in college, which is not really a joke I get because I never listened to them. Nowadays, more than ever, the Grumman is extremely expensive and difficult to maintain. There are about 140,000 active LLVs, which account for about 74% of the USPS fleet. Every year, LLVs alone travel 765 million miles across the US. And I'm no math boy, but I did some quick math here. 765 million miles traveled divided by nine miles per gallon equals 85 million gallons used per year by LLVs. The national average for a gallon of gas when we film this is at $2.16, which is insane. I need to get out of LA. 85 million times 216 equals $183,855,000 per year spent on gas just for the LLVs. If I snapped and all these vehicles were instantly replaced by Kia Souls, they would save $126 million every year in gas alone. On top of that, a report from the USPS said that each vehicle costs an average of $3,000 per year in repairs and maintenance. This is outrageous. But the dumbest part is that the LLVs are so old and outdated that it's kind of hard to find mechanics who will even work on them. If you thought that's where the problems ended though, <laughs> just wait. Beyond the engine and maintenance, these things catch on fire all the time. Since 2014, a whopping 407 Grumman LLVs have spontaneously burst into flames. Why do these things catch on fire? Well, I'm glad you asked. In addition to being old as hell, the windshield wiper fluid reservoir was positioned over the engine control unit and was prone to leaking, causing short circuiting and sometimes fire. This is an entirely different issue than why Iron Duke powered Fieros caught fire in the 80s. The issue with those is that they had to shorten the oil pan, which caused the oil to heat up way quicker, blah, blah, blah. Check out the up to speed on the Fiero if you want to know more. 20% of your cars catching on fire is way too many of your cars catching on fire. I mean, look, I actually still love the LLV. I even bought one of those little die casts from the post service. But the question still stands, why haven't these things been replaced yet? Well, the truth is, it should have happened a long time ago. The long list of delays and the quest for the Grumman's replacement started in 2009, just one year before the first generation of trucks predetermined expiration date. The USPS just plain wasn't financially or logistically ready to replace the vehicles on a large scale. So they implemented a preventative repair program to extend the lifetime of the Grumman from 24 to 30 years. This bought them enough time to get their poop in a group and they officially launched a program to find the next generation delivery vehicle in 2016. The idea for the search was pretty much identical to their setup before. 
The USPS put millions of dollars into contracts for automakers to produce a prototype specifically suited to the post office needs. The major difference this time around, however, is the emphasis on alternative fuel options. It's no secret that the future of the automotive industry is going to have a lot more EVs and hybrids in it, and choosing the type of fuel the USPS mail truck runs on will be incredibly influential to the automotive landscape of the country. Plus, you, got, you have to make an improvement on 9 miles per gallon. Like, please. Several companies threw their hats in the ring for a chance at the estimated $6.3 billion USPS contract, but after years of trials, delays, funding problems, and more delays, the search for the next generation delivery vehicle is finally postponed again. That's right, already three years late, the USPS announced in December 2020 that due to complications related to the pandemic, they are delaying the contract yet again. But the good news is, they are making progress. They've narrowed it down to three finalists. The first prototype comes from a collaboration between Carsan and Morgan Olson. Their mail vehicle is a hybrid plug-in design. It's got a super wide windshield with a tall stature and honestly looks kind of like a party bus. The second prospect comes from a company called Workhorse. Originally, they were partnered up with commercial truck makers Hackney, but they dropped out leaving Workhorse on their own. I guess Hackney couldn't hack it. <laughs> This vehicle is battery powered, it's electric, also has a huge windshield and cargo area, and honestly, looks the most reminiscent of the Grumman LLV. Last but not least is a collaboration between truck manufacturer Oshkosh and Ford. It's based off the Ford Transit van with the addition of extra cargo space, four wheel drive, and a sliding door. If I had to put my money on it, I'd probably say that the Ford Transit has the best shot of becoming our next mail vehicle, uh, Ford and Oshkosh are already huge manufacturers with established relationships with the government. And when it comes to this kind of stuff, it's really all about who you know. But the question remains, when is it gonna happen? Barring additional delays, we can expect the decision to be made sometime in the middle of 2021. This year has forced so many cancellations and delays across all industries, no exception for car production. But there is light at the end of the tunnel and hope on the horizon for a new era of mail carrying vehicles. It's all but certain that they'll be cheaper, more comfortable, and safer than the legendary but deteriorating Grumman LLV. And hopefully they won't burst into flames quite as often either. Thank you very much for watching Wheelhouse. If you'd like to give those LLVs a little more work, we do have a uh, P.O. box, which I'll place right here. P.O. box 64669. Yeah, you can send us some fan mail. Please don't send us anything perishable or alive. We don't check it that often. You know, the, the LLV obviously has a lot of issues, um, but I'm just surprised that they've lasted this long. They're an icon of American culture, in my opinion. I support the USPS. Here's a picture of me with all my gear. Stay safe. Uh, be kind. I'll see you next time.